come and do a workshop here, so that's what I'm I'm here to talk about. And, uh, I'm going to cover with. Let me pray for us real quick to get started. Lord, we thank you for the for the awesome morning and the meal that you provided us for the energy to get us uh, started through the rest of the afternoon. We know that it came from you, and it's for your glory. And we we ask that you. Uh, Help us be with open minds as we're here today. We all have our ideas of, of how to do things, but we know that they're always uh, supplanted by yours. And hopefully through some of this information and the brief time we have for minimal conversation, uh, it'll all be directed towards uh, serving your kingdom. And that would be Son Jesus' whose name. We always pray. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to take you through this. Uh, now, everything I show you will not be in there. Uh, I'm calling this Becoming Fishers of Men, and it'll make more sense to you real quickly. But I have three questions, and that's not in here, but I, I have two sets of questions I ask men. If, it's a, if there's men in the audience that I'm not sure are churched men, so to speak, which I know is a broad term, mm -hmm. I have a different set. But the fact that y'all have come to this, I'm asking you, my, you know, these are my churched men questions. Number one, do you believe that God created you on purpose for a purpose? Yes. Yeah. And then the second, if you do, do you believe that, you know, a mean God would create you on, on purpose for a purpose but not give you a way to fulfill it? Ours is not a, a mean God. He, do you believe that he gives you a calling or a plan to fulfill that? And if the answer to that one is yes, then the third question I have, do you know what that calling is? Because the beauty to God is that, you know, the group of us in here, are all created unique to each other by God, but for His glory and His plan is for it to all come together, and that's where our calling is. So if we can, if we can ever find that, and you know, I have a daughter that I tell her, if you can ever work for your, your 28, a lot of you, I tell you, unless you marry well, you're going to be working for a lot of years. In your life. That's part of God's plan, and if you could ever do that with something that you're passionate about, how much more fun would that be to do that work? And so that's the calling part. Uh, now, I'm going to tell you that in my opinion, now everything in here is, is, is scriptural and or my opinion. And I, and, and, and I believe that God had, that Jesus had two callings when he came to earth. And the fact, first calling that we spend a lot of time in the church talking about is the fact, you know, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. The eleven went to Galilee. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Jesus said, "All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations." That's, in fact, the global mission statement of, I believe, of the United Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And I buy into that for the church. But what did Jesus first say? Oops, sorry. His first commandment was way before that when he finally picked his disciples and talks about in John that he, he said come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for men yes. come fishers of men depending on your translation mm -hmm. this is where he picked his 12 that were all different vocations and with his plan was to end up here three plus years later but he had to spend those three years with them getting them to understand who they were and how God was calling them to serve the kingdom. We need as the church, and especially in men's ministry, let's don't lose sight of the fact that we need to help men, and you need to get real confident and comfortable that you're knowing who God is calling you to be as part of this. We've got men that, and, and, and I travel a good bit, I've been helping the commission now for about 10 years, I see a lot of men doing a lot of tremendous hard work. And in some cases, it's wearing them out, mentally as much as physically. And I'm afraid what could be happening is they're serving outside of what God's really calling them to be and do. For example, leadership. We always need leaders in, the, in men's ministry. We have men in place who are leaders of local churches, districts, and the only reason they're in that leadership role is nobody else would do it. And I, I, and I don't know whether that speaks directly to y'all or not, but I can speak to my own church in uh, Oviedo, Florida to tell you that mm -hmm. the president of our local men's ministry is there because nobody else would do it. And Bill stepped up and said, okay. That's probably not the best reason to do something. Mm -hmm. 
Maybe God's not calling Bill to be a leader. Maybe God's calling Bill to be a teacher. Or, or So how do we help do this? And we begin by asking men's questions. This should be in your handout. And this is going to, today's conversation is really going to be all about you. So here's just an idea of some questions that I ask. We're not going to have time to go over them today, but how am I growing in my faith? <coughs> These are questions you can ask yourself. How am I using my gifts? Now the setup to that is you've got to, you got to know what your gifts are to know how, you know, how you're doing with using them, and we'll talk about that. And then how am I serving others? These are kind of a self-reflection coming back to am I becoming the fisher of men that God is calling me to be. We're all going to have to be making disciples, and, and that's all what we want to do, because the church needs to live and grow. So here's some ideas that I have. And this next handout, don't get too wrapped up in it, but turn the page, and you're going to see. I feel like my calling in this season of my ministry right now from God is to help equip men to become who God's calling them to be. Training and equipping, which is what I'm doing with you here for this brief. This is what I think God's calling me to do. And in the last year of, of doing this, I'm realizing we spent a lot of time here for, on the church. We spend a lot of time on men's ministry. But we're not spending enough time, in my opinion, on the self part. Are we becoming who God's calling us to be first? If we do that, in my mind's eye, the ministry will take care of itself because we'll be there doing the right stuff for the right ministry. And if the right ministries are doing God's work, then the ministry, to me, is what makes up the church. So I'm going to spend some time with you today and talk about some of these resources that can be used for your self-development <clears throat> as a follower of Jesus Christ. And you know, when you think about it, people... My daughter, 28, so she's in that millennial group. And people, you know, they, they've created the word self that came because of that group. I'm a boomer. I'll be 68 in a couple of months. We didn't take selfies when I was 28 years old. <laughs> it just wasn't what we did. Now everybody's taking selfies. So it's something they've created. What's the word? Selfie. 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 Yeah, selfie. 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 Okay. You do it with your wife. And you, my wife and I tried it. didn't work out well. We don't know how to, I don't have the dexterity. It can be bad. But rather, than, but rather than say, you know, that these kids are selfish, they're really not. They're, they're actually looking maybe more inward at who they are than maybe my generation did. So let's take advantage of that and, and, and help them find out who they are. And there are ways to do that. So this first book, and I've got some samples. You're not going to have really time to look at them much, but these are some resources that I have found over the years. This is a book done in the 80s by a gentleman named Bruce Busby. And I want to show you a video first, and then, and then we'll talk about it. Just, just watch this and see if this couldn't help your church. And I've got the sound as high as I can get it on the top here. I'm not sure I'm really making a difference. I feel frustrated. I asked to get involved, but nobody called me. I suppose I served my church out of guilt. I felt abandoned. <sighs> I'm too old to be of any service to God. I want to serve, but I don't feel adequate. I mean, I put the nice of work into an event. No one even said thanks. I got stuck in a position I didn't like and eventually burned out. Imagine a church that is taught by gifted teachers, that is led by people with the gift of leadership, administered by people with the gift of administration. A church that has evangelists using their gift of evangelism, mercy people, encouragement people, and hospitality people, all using their gifts. Imagine a church where those serving are confident, motivated, confident and enthusiastic. People that are connected to caring relationships and meaningful ministries. Imagine a church that's equipping the people of God to fulfill their ministry to the body and their mission in the world. Imagine 
imagine a church, imagine your church. I believe that the church, corporate, University Methodist Church of San Antonio, as a body, has a responsibility to help the members discover who they are and what their role is in serving the kingdom. I believe that. Through resources, etc., through a facility to come on Sundays and Wednesdays. The church owns that. But when I was training in my years in business, I would tell a group of, of employees right about now, I'd say, they, they, we own 50% of it. You own the other 50% is to, is to seek it out and do something about finding out what your job is. And so I think the church owns it, but we also own it ourselves. We need to be interested enough to know. And the, the way this is, is made up, and it's a beautiful process, it's so much bigger. People think of it as just spiritual gifts. He calls it a servant profile in the book. And it's, it's made up of spiritual gifts, personal style, and ministry passion. This is like six chapters in this book. Your spiritual gifts, I think the Methodist Church recognizes 23 spiritual gifts. And in and, and, and Scripture it says the day you became a believer is the talents that you may have been using in your life just became spiritual gifts when you do it for the glory of God. Yes. So you are now using those talents and that's what you do best. That's why if your gift is leadership, and you're leading, you are doing what God is creating you to do. If it's not your gift, you're doing the best you can, but it's probably God it probably would rather have you be doing something else. So this is spiritual gifts are about the what? Your personal style, you are wired out of the, the those of us just sitting here today, we all look at life in different ways. And some of you are people driven and task driven are two resources. Some of you just enjoy the fellowship and relationship of being together on a day like today. Some of us would much rather just be somewhere else doing something. We don't really embrace the, the, the fellowship as much as we do the work part of it. And, and that's okay because God created both ways. And the other part is some of you are, are very unorgan can deal with unorganization. You can create something. I can tell you you know, we need to do this, and you'll go out and have this vision of how to do it. Others of us, you give me the vision, I'll build it. I don't, I'm not good about working on it. So that's what they call your personal style. And these are three assessments that you do in here. Depending on how you answer that assessment, you will have a gift, and you will have one of these four styles. And that's how you best serve. If you're in that environment and you're using your gifts and you're doing it in the style, if you're a people-driven person and you're in relationship with other men and women doing it, you are in your sweet spot and you're really enjoying it. And that's where you're going to really feel confident about what you do. The last part is your ministry passion. There's a way in here of going back and looking at what you've done in the past in ministry and are there any common threads. Yours could end up being men's ministry is what you're passionate about. It is mine. So you would put these three together. This is where you're motivated from. And from these three assessments, you pretty much can figure out what God's calling you to. So this is a great resource. I do this in either classroom, locally, but I also I do them in three one-and-a-half-hour uh, Zoom meeting sessions mm -hmm. electronically. do it all over the country. So I'm, I have some cards up here. If any of these pique an interest of yours, I'm doing these all the time. But this is, to me is a first step. That's the reason I had them. I, I've actually numbered them in what I think the importance is. If you don't know what your gifts are, I promise you, you are busting yourself and, and working extremely hard to build the church. And, you, and, and God appreciates every bit of it. None of it's lost. The worst thing I can do, I think, when I die and cross over and God said, you know, Bess, you did a lot of good stuff for the church. It wasn't any of it what I wanted you to do. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. The worst case is I, I just didn't do it in my giftedness, but I still tried to help the king. He would love for me to really do it in a sweet spot in the way he created me to do it. And that's kind of what this is about. So I, I hate that I'm rushing through this, but I just want to show you enough of this to keep your interest in right here. This is a book that I came across that's by a gentleman named J.D. Walt. It's called, the name of it is called, 
I'm going to show you a little two and a half minute video and he'll explain it more than I can and then we'll come back. One of the biggest questions that seemingly everybody has is what am I supposed to do with my life? We hear it constantly, and it's not just from people who are, um, you know, like in college, uh, kind of a zone, but all throughout people's lives are asking this question, what, what am I to do with my life? I want my life to make a difference. And so oftentimes, um, people become alive in the Holy Spirit and on fire for Christ, and they begin to think, well, I, I need to go into the ministry, as in become a clergy person. And while that may be true for some, it's probably not true for most. But the issue is one of discerning what a person's calling really is. So we've read this book called, called, <laughs> you think and the, the tagline is following a future filled with the possible. The book is not designed to tell you what you should do or how do you figure out the magic formula of what my life is supposed to, to be given to in terms of a job. As much as it is to back a couple of steps back from that question and lead a person into uh, a discernment, an understanding of how calling works throughout the scriptures and the ways that, that God is working and how to interpret the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's a 21-day book. It uh, is a daily book that's designed to be read and journaled along with it. There's some, uh, hopefully, really engaging questions that will lead you to, to do some of your own sort of processing of your uh, inner life and the sense of what God is saying. This book has been, it's been a, a really, we've heard a lot of people who are using this like as a resource in campus ministry. Uh, for students, it could be a, a Bible study that you could go anywhere from, you know, three to six weeks with. It's a good book just for a person, an individual, who is wrestling with uh, an awakening in their life and wondering what are the implications of it. You can get it, uh, of course, on cband.com uh, electronically or in print. And uh, thanks for taking a look. I, I don't know where I came across it, but I bought it. It cost me like, I think, seven bucks. And it's a 21-day little journal. It was a page and a half of reading. Like day one was this page and to here. And then it said, have you seen the light? Can you tell your own story in the framework of darkness to light? Sketch out the... So who was I before I began my journey and who was I? It probably took me 10, 15 minutes to do it. But here's the one thing that on, on day eight, it says, before we go any further, let's get one thing settled. Our first, middle, and last calling by God is not to a place, a position, or a role. Now, is there any of you uh, district or conference presidents of the United Methodist Men? Your calling isn't to be a president. It's to a person in the person of Jesus Christ. If you look at Ephesians 4.1, it talks about the guy who's called you and he sent you to his church to be equipped to become mature in the faith to build up the body of Christ. So when you answer God's call, that moment as Wesley talks about justification, and you start the sanctification process, the moment you start that, you're to go to the kingdom and Jesus will use your gifts and your personal style and your passion to create your calling to build the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And that's where, within that calling, is where you become a conference president. God doesn't call us to be political people. Politics may be part of our <clears throat> calling. So this, I've done this with some guys, not as a group. I've given the book out to some of them and just said, hey. And what it did to me was it validated and reaffirmed, I, I am convinced, more than ever, that God created me on purpose and for a purpose unique to anybody else. And he is calling me to fulfill that purpose in a kingdom-building way. 
So if sometime, you know, I needed this. At some point, God brought it to me and I used it. So that's that's just a little thing. And he, he talked about you could do it as a group. I, this is probably only about two months into my journey here. This next is, is, is coming back to Wesley. Uh, anybody familiar with the term class meeting back in Wesley's journey? I'm going to take you just quickly. And here's a guy. This is Kevin Watson. He's a Methodist uh, pastor. I don't remember where he is. Uh, he's going to do like a little two-minute introduction, then I want to talk a little bit about it. But here's Kevin Watson. If there were one thing that you could do that would be most likely to bring a deep change to your life, to bring renewal in your faith, that would be most likely to bring transformation not just in your life, but in the lives of people that you care deeply about in the life of the church, what would that be? I would suggest that that would be entering into a small group that's focused on deep life change, that's focused on experiencing and pursuing the transformation that God has for us through what's possible because of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That we would not settle for anything less, that we would pursue that in the context of community, of coming together to support one another and watch over one another in love. That's the purpose of my book, The Class Meeting, which is about a kind of small group that started in early Methodism that was focused on answering the basic question, how does your soul prosper? How is your life in God? What's God up to in your life? And in the book, it talks about the history of this group and the way that it was used by God among the people called Methodists to really bring a season of renewal, even revival, within a particular part of the body of Christ, where people came to faith and droves, and most interestingly, where people not just came to faith, but grew in their faith, experiencing freedom from the ways of sin and death, where they experienced God breaking the power of canceled sin in their lives, where they experienced more and more of God's desire for them, what God had for them in their lives. Wesley and the early Methodists felt like the most important and most fundamental way of pursuing this and experiencing this was by coming together in a small group of people to simply repeatedly come together and say, what's God? What's God doing to pay attention, to cultivate attentiveness to God's work in our lives? So I hope that you'll join me in this study, and I hope that you will experience uh, the risen Savior in new and transformative ways as you do so. Notice that's another publication. Seedbed is a publishing company out of Nashville, I think. I don't I don't believe they're connected with the Methodist Church. But Nashville is a you know is a huge place for the, for the church. So this is a book, and again he wrote it. Uh, Gil Hankey, who's the general secretary of, of uh, the commission, came across this. I think he went to a typical church meeting and Kevin Watson was there probably three years ago and talked about his book. Gil came back all excited, sent us a copy. We, we did it together as a study electronically. It's like eight chapters. The first four chapters are all about uh, the history of Methodism in regards to the class meeting. And it, it, I didn't know it. I didn't know that part of the history, so it was awesome to me. The other four chapters are basically how do you, how do you run, a, put together and run a small group? Somebody's got to lead, somebody's got to lead. So, so it's done like as an eight week study with the design being afterwards that you continue to meet, but as a class meeting group instead of what, uh, you know, he talks in here about there's three types of, of small groups in the church or Sunday school. Are any of you involved in, in any small group or Sunday school classes? In the church? Okay. <laughs> he, puts it, he puts it in three areas. Number one, he calls affinity, A-F-F-A-N. And, and those are just common interests. That could be something like right now, the basketball March Madness is going on. People that really yeah. dig basketball could be having meetings for the brackets and everything. So these are people that meet together because they have a common interest called affinity. And that's okay. The other group is called informational groups, which would be Bible studies where we do the Book of Romans, we do, we do Genesis, we do a Max Lucado study, which ought to be real appropriate for San Antonio, which I think. 
Max Licato is probably the best storyteller I've ever heard in regards to Christian literature. Mm -hmm. But that's information that you're getting, <clears throat> and then to try to do something with it. So that's those two. What the class meeting that Wesley designed it around wasn't as a Bible study. The, the history of it actually is they, they were getting ready to build a church, the building, and they needed to raise money. So Wesley got with some of his leaders and said, all right, each of you get a group of 12 of the parishioners together, and you all meet once a week, and at the beginning of the meeting, you collect a penny from each other. And we bring the pennies together, and the pennies are what's going to build the building for us. And they started doing that. And all the people that were part of the <clears throat> church area came in and created these groups. Well, they found out in a hurry. And Wesley come back, being the man he is, he says, after you've collected your penny, talk to them about the rules of the three rules of discipleship and see are they following those. Well, the three rules basically are do no harm, do good, and love God, to shorten it up. And they started asking those questions. And the people weren't concentrating on doing good. They weren't concentrating on not doing harm. And God wasn't a visible part of their lives. So all these were, were money collection meetings. And Wesley said, you know what, we got to start getting serious. And that all the rules of discipleship became part, became part of it. And the book in here describes the leader like if we were a group and I was leading it. I would, we would sit down for an hour, one hour a week. No videos, no Bible study. We would just come to this room. And we would sit down and chit chat, and I'd, somebody would pray us in, and then I'd say, "Okay, uh, you know, here, here's my sighting of God this week. Here's what God I saw God in my, my life, and here's the impression it's been." So that's the conversation we had, and it can be. I, I've got now four groups at my local church. One women, which I wasn't really headed down that road, but I had done two groups of men, and a couple of wives came to me at the church, and they said, "You know, I don't know what what." Y'all did in that study with Gordon, but he's starting to read his Bible again. And, I, and he's praying again. So would you do a class? So I did. My wife went to it, and I think it's like, if they all come, I think there's like 11 women and then three other guys. And that's the meeting. I got one on Tuesday night, one on Wednesday night, and one on Saturday morning. And they come together for an hour. And they sit down and say, you know what? I had a great week, man. I saw God all in it. Or I got so sucked into work this week, you know what? I missed him. You know, so I, what can you do next week not to miss him? And you just start that conversation. So here's here's what it looks like. And, and, and the way it was actually created was the society was created last. But this piece of information I found brought this to Jesus' mission on the earth, you know, when he was here. The society was, was the crowd of the multitudes that were following Jesus. Think of that as, as what the society is. That would be today's church. And the purpose of it is to bring out about change in knowledge. What did Jesus do to the crowd? He preached to them. He did miracles. He tried to give them knowledge about what the, what the new kingdom could look like. That's the whole intent for tomorrow when we go to churches, wherever we are. That's the intent of going. The hour that we spend at church tomorrow is not, in most cases, going to be very transformational for us. Mm -hmm. it's boom, we're here. But it is knowledge. We need knowledge to be able to change. The second part, the class meeting, when he built those, think of that as Jesus' 12 disciples. They were together as a group for three plus years. The idea behind Wesley's purpose in there is to bring about behavioral change. He said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And you know that he worked with Peter on a certain thing because he knew he wanted Peter to be this. And he had John to do this, and he had James, and what was it, Matthew, and I'm trying to think of all the other. Jesus kind of worked with them on the behavioral change that he wanted them to exhibit when it was time to go make disciples. And then you've heard about Jesus' inner circle, James, John, and Peter. Uh, this is an example of, in, in, in Wesley's terms, he went from 12 people down to just three or four. <clears throat> and these were the people that really sat down each week. And I said, okay, I told y'all this week that I was going to pray every morning with my wife. And we either did it or we didn't. And now I'm telling you I did or didn't. And you're going to say, why didn't you? And it's really a more intense piece. So here's, 
here's my uh, here's my PowerPoint building visual that I'm going to show you. Here's the society. Now this is and, and think of San Antonio or, or some of y'all I think are from from Austin. Austin. Think think of your church. This is your church. But this was the third step. What he began with, and I couldn't get this other circle on class. He started creating, and these were the meetings where you came and brought your penny in. These were the meetings where you brought your penny in, but you started soon talking about where it's got in your life. And then from that, within those, where groups of guys got together and said, you know what, I'd like to spend, let's, let's let the three of us spend more time. I really want to talk deeper about my faith. And then from that is where they, within a geography, the society was created from outward in. And that's kind of what Jesus did with the church. He didn't, the disciples created the church. Jesus created the disciples and said, go make disciples. And the church came out of that as a place for us to congregate corporately and do things. So this is, and if, this is the one part that we probably have totally, unless your church is any different, I find very few churches that are meeting. I see a lot of informational study, which we need information. But I see, I don't see many where it's more transformational, where you're really having that, what they call Christian conversations. Where is God in your life this week? And I told the guys, one of them, we're in, we did it March a year ago, so we're in our third, first full year of doing it. And I said, at the beginning, some of you couldn't even find God in your life. You knew that a lot of stuff good happened, and then you start looking at it, so you know what that is, God being. So once you created the awareness, now we're a little bit deeper. Because each week when we report, we say, okay, and how am I different because of that? If you, if you witness God's presence in your life, but you continue to not change and you continue to do the wrong things you're doing, but yet, yeah, God was with me Tuesday and Wednesday I went back to what I was doing. Unless change occurs over a period of time, you're going to lose the men. And I think that's what happens in some of our informational groups, is there's a lot of awesome studies coming out. But unless we can take some of that information from Sunday school and use it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, at some point it's just going to be more information. And my head is about to explode with all the information I have about Max Licato and Adam Hamilton and, and all the writers. Unless I do something with it, and I think that's where men after a while said, you know, it's just it's not worth the trouble. If you haven't been able to accomplish just, and some of y'all do it not under the guise of a class meeting. If some of you spend any of your life together with other men, intentionally though, to talk about how's my week been? You know what, it was a good God week. Or it wasn't, you know, I just got sucked in. We're doing all this stuff at work and I got too busy. And I, and I took the glory for it instead of, if you haven't done something, you, if, if we could just get people doing this again. You don't have to do the book. We can have people join these groups I'm talking about that hadn't read the book. I tell them, I, I tell them in, the, in, the, in the meeting, I said, if you find somebody that you think would enjoy being part of you sitting down on Tuesday nights at 6.30, invite them. The book is not the purpose we're doing it. Sharing our faith and, and being aware of God in our life is the reason. The book to me was just an awesome study to get me get started. So that's it. This is Lead Like Jesus. This is a ministry. It's by a gentleman named Ken Blanchard. If you haven't, uh, Ken Blanchard started a business back in the 80s called Situational Leadership in San Diego, California. It's still probably one of the preeminent leadership development uh, models in the world. He became a Christian when he was 65. He's now 70, late 70s. As soon as he became that, he realized that the model that he had for situation leadership was the model of Jesus in the 12, and he began a ministry in 2010 called Lead Like Jesus. I found it. I've been certified in it. I'm a trainer that I equip other people. He joined with his uh, Cornell University uh, partner, Phil Hodges, and they put it together. And here's what it's about. It's a ministry, again, in, in envisioning Jesus, but it's, it's you begin in the heart. And I'll show you in a minute how Jesus took those 12 and started, but you've got to change. 
you got to find out from the heart why somebody wants to leave. Because if they can't answer why they want to, it may not, may not be what they need to be doing. But why do I lead? The head is you have to have a belief about leadership. The third part is the hands, and that's when you actually, when Jesus started sending the disciples out to practice being disciples, they were ready to start doing it, and then you have habits. So the whole, this is a 10-hour course, and I'll tell you more in a minute. All right, so here's another little short video. Why, why Jesus? Think of Jesus, the question here, why, is really, why, why would you consider Jesus a servant leader? We know that he was the son of God, that he's our, he's our connection uh, to God. We know he was a, the Messiah. We know, but why a leader? And so here's... A lot of us know the name and popularity of Jesus. The stories, the miracles, and the personality of Jesus. We come across statues, architecture, fashion, and art that exalt his name. No one has had greater influence in history. This man, this one man who lived on earth 2,000 years ago, has shaped and transformed so many. But is his word relevant to leaders today? Can the way he led help us lead others? Timeless truths, more than a gifted teacher whose wisdom enlightened minds, whose way of influencing and loving others redefined the very essence of leadership, offering a model for true strength and purpose. Why, Jesus, you ask? Here's an answer to this simple question. The leadership of Jesus is radically different from any other model of leadership known to man. No other leader has compelled people to join such a cause. The planned effect being to redeem, to restore our broken world. Assembling a flawed group of men, he set a standard for building teams. The men he invested in and empowered eventually laid it down their lives for his cause. Why, Jesus? Knowing that his time on earth was short, he strategized a plan that would allow his vision for this world to carry on through his faithful followers. No other leader has led such a movement throughout the ages. Why, Jesus? Because Jesus remained innocent with his divine power in the face of temptation when the enemy tested him. Why, Jesus? Because where others have fallen to selfishness, greed, or gratification, Jesus didn't falter. When have the powerful bowed down their knees to serve their followers? What king, emperor, or president flipped their kingdom upside down just to help those who should help them? Why, Jesus? Because this was no ordinary man. He is the standard, the model for all our challenges and problems. And the more we lead with his spirit, the more we hear it and allow ourselves to be transformed by it. By his power and authority, we can lead like Jesus. Now, I had to minimize the number of slides here just for our sake of time, but I want you to visualize the definition of leadership is seeking to influence the behavior, development, or actions of somebody else. Influence is the key. Now, some of you are still in the business world. Some of us have, have been spent a lot of years in it and now aren't through retirement. Your typical leadership, corporate leadership, is really not as much about developing people as it is getting results. And here's where, uh, here, here, here's the example scripturally. So you say, well, that's great, but where is it in the Bible? So I'm going to begin with, here's when Jesus picked the 12. And here's the scripture that comes along with it. Matthew 4, 19 through 20. Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's when he picked them and said, I will change you. And it begins itself. He said, Peter, I'm going to change you from fishing for fish. And you now become a fisher of men. So I'm going to work on yourself first. The second part of this is, the scripture of Matthew 14, 30 through 31, and this is about when you're leading another person. This is when Jesus was walking across the water and they fed the thousands. Jesus said, go across the lake. I'm going to go, I'm going to go pray and, and, I'll, and I'll meet you over there. And he comes walking across during the night and they see him. They think it's a ghost. And they, the Bible says, Peter is the one that said, Lord, if it's you, let me know, you know, and I'll come to you. This was the moment that, that 
that Jesus was trying to get these 12 to trust him. This was an example of, of, of Peter being willing to believe that you, if you really are who you say you are, then tell me and I'll, I should be able to walk on water. Well, he did for a couple of steps till he realized who he was. And so this was Jesus' opportunity to create trust in, in Peter and the others. And there's other scripture. When they led others, it was John 13, uh, 13 and 14, is when Jesus, that night of the, of the, the, the final meal, when he washed the feet of the, of the disciples and said, as I have done for you, now you're going to do for each other. Because he knew now they needed to be together as a community if they were going to come out and be the church. And then here at the very end, when you're ready to lead an organization, when they were ready, then he knew he could go back to the Father. And he said, now go make disciples. So this is from beginning the day they came off the boats to all the way on the mountain when he said, now go go make disciples. And you got to think, of the, the, these were 11 men that, and, and these statistics are probably a year or two old, but they say there's like 7 billion people that have been counted in the world. There's probably some that happened, but of the 7 billion that have been counted, almost 3 billion of them, 2.9, claim to be Christian. All of that started from 11 men. If those 11 men did not come back, and not done what Jesus taught them, and this would be a Rotary Club meeting or, or a Jewish synagogue we were in or something. It wouldn't be a Christian church. So this is a perfect example of how you develop people. And here, if you had to say, I, how many of you have been to leadership training of some sort in business and you know, over the years? Most of it has been tactical. I was with Scott's Miracle Grow Company. We sold fertilizer and wheat killer. And most of our training in, in developing these people was how to be so their role in selling fertilizer weekly. Mm. I didn't worry about them being developed because we were paying them to be leaders. I was teaching you marketing's new way of leading, of selling this stuff. If you don't want to be a leader, then let me know and I'll get somebody else who will. It wasn't about you. It was about the tactics. <laughs> Certain leadership in this model is where Jesus developed the character of the 12 first. And then he said, you know, just follow me. I'll teach you how to do it. Just pay attention and let me make sure you know who you are. So the beauty to servant leadership is it's about the person. That's why it has to come from the heart. Mm -hmm. Unless somebody changes their heart, then any, any, any brief behavior change is just going to be a brief modification. They're going to go right back to where they were. Mm -hmm. If you start here trying to lead without here, then it's going to be short term because you're going to get sucked into whatever the next shiny model is that, that you got to come out of here. And that's the beauty to this ministry. I do about 12. This is about a 10 and a half hour course. This is the book they wrote. Two of them came together. Uh, Phil Hodges and Kim Blanchard, they have, have, they have rewritten it. It's called Revisited After. Again, it started in 2010. You can, you can purchase this book on Amazon or anybody else. And it's set up as, a, you know, you can do a six-week study. It has study questions. Here's a formal guide that can be done. I also do a 10-hour workshop where I come around. I've done it in Houston. I've done it in Dallas. Uh, did two in Louisiana last year. I'm hoping from talking. Milton uh, Chapman was going to try to come. I did one in Natchitoches, right on the Texas-Louisiana border. And he wasn't able to come. But he's going to maybe try it. To get something done in real. I see they have something on YouTube. I was looking at this because I liked it. Yeah. They have about hour, two hour talks. Do you know what those are about? Have you ever seen those on YouTube? Uh, by Blanchard or? Yeah, by these guys. Yeah. Okay. Are they just talking about the book or? Some of it. Some of them, if they look like they're older videos. Yeah, they're like older videos. Yeah. That's when they first were building the ministry, because okay. this ministry has a lot of videos in it as you're going oh, okay. through the hard head hands and habits. There's videos where Blanchard is teaching, Hodges is teaching. Okay. If they look like they're in a real captive audience, kind of a canned mm -hmm. presentation, they were building videos for the ministry. And, uh, but I tell you what, and the beauty to what I like is I do a lot of training with men. And, and I like men. God, when, when I finally answered that, 52 is when I finally surrendered and God said, you know what, it took you long enough, Bash. <laughs> and guess what, there's a lot of guys that hadn't answered yet. I want you to go help me find that. And so that's kind of what I've been 
But the beauty to this is, and just think of your local church. I talked to Gary at lunch. Think of your local church, the leadership of your local church, clergy and lay. Some of you may have female pastors. I guarantee you have some female lady leaders. And then you think of, uh, of, of men and women. So the mix that came from your church should be 60, 60 men, 40% women. If it was really accurate to the demographic of your church, it probably flipped. It probably 60% women and 40% men that are really leading. But the beauty to it is, is there are women that are able to come to this training, and they should be here. If you do this training, if I were to come help you do it at your church and two or three others, and no women came, and you went back to your church and tried to install this, you'd be missing 40% of the leaders that you're going to have to teach all this to because they weren't there. And that's the beauty, because this is kingdom building. And I believe that this will get closer to the church developing people when the women and the men and the clergy and the laity are all together, because those are the ones that God has called, like a man's first church will be healed. The people called to lead at that church, God also has a plan for them to become who he wants them. So uh, we're hoping to, to do some of this, but these, these can all be purchased. And, and again, I have cards up here, and if any of you, I got two sets. I have my Lead Like Jesus cards. And then these are my, uh, my my general commission. But either one have information. If you have any interest beyond what we're doing, uh, pass that, and I'll be glad to spend time with you. Uh, anybody heard of DISC? It's a personality assessment. Been around forever. It's kind of like Myers Briggs. It's a uh, it's a behavioral assessment. There's a guy in Texas, I'm thinking, in Houston, at one of the seminaries, that actually came up and developed a biblical DISC. Which I'm not going to get in a lot of detail. I'm just going to show you like this, this example. This examines your observable behaviors. Again, you're all unique in here. You all have different, and they're based off of your needs and fears. Your human nature, needs and fears determine your behaviors. And depending on how you act on those, you're either going to be dominant, you, 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 you're going to be intuitive, you're going to be, uh, uh, shoot, what is that? And then cautious. These are the four areas. If you really want to get deep into who you are from a personality standpoint, you can also do these. As an example, with that, you know, this is somebody's natural behavior. This person is a pretty dominant individual, and by nature, they're less so. If you're going to be high here, you've got to be low somewhere else for 100 percent. What this takes a look at is you have your natural, but in the workplace. And in, the, and in the ministry place, you may have to work outside of where you would like to be. For example, if some of you by nature are, 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 are more servants, and for your ministry, you're in a leader position, to be effective in the position you have, you're going to have to demonstrate a higher level of, of, of the dominant than you may have in your heart. And that's what's got you working outside. So this is another way to help you be as effective as possible doing ministry because you're doing it where you're natural. And now being dominant doesn't mean overbearing. It just means, and, and, I, and I really don't have the time to get into it, but it really means that, that, that you want to be in charge. You feel like you have something to bring, you know, from that part of it. So, I've done this in a hurry. And here's the first five. Mm -hmm. You've heard of Fruit of the Spirit? That's biblical. I still, don't know, I still can't say all that. I think I get three or four. But the fruit of the Spirit should be a behavior that comes out of you working in your, in your calling because it's going to be when you're, when you're really where God's calling you to be, then you should be patient, you should be loving, you should be peaceful, and etc. What I want to show you just how this would work in visioning would be your next step would be if you were to do these and be working on yourself, then if this was a ministry team at a church, you may want to look at crafting a vision, doing some different things. As a church, if you could ever get the pastors together, that's why Lead Like Jesus is actually, uh, it should have been in here, it's actually in all three because it, believe, it goes with personal leadership all the way up to the church. No man left behind. Have you heard, any, have you heard of that? The man in the mirror ministry? 
That's a group, uh, Pat Morley wrote a book back in the 70s called Man and the Mayor. It's one of the top selling, I think, 100 of the, of the uh, 19th century uh, top 100 uh, Christian books. He has a ministry. We partnered with them as United Methodist Men back in about 2008. And we do their training. We call it Understanding Men's Ministry. This is a group in Nashville, Tennessee that I did. That's myself. There's Joe Kelly. is from Louisiana. I'm trying to think who else. Kenneth Tilke was from Texas. I don't know if any of y'all knew Kenneth, who's passed on. Uh, so this was a group. Here's the first one I ever did in, 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 in Orlando. Here's the district superintendent, which was awesome that he showed up. And this is a North Georgia group. This is a model. But, but look at the definition of discipling. This is what I like about what they talk about. A disciple is somebody who's following Jesus, being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission. So you heard Greg and, and Robert this morning talk about not everybody's following. You'll have people that will come to church tomorrow. That's right that are coming to church. They're not coming to follow Jesus and to glorify God. If we can get people that following Jesus, then they start becoming a disciple. And that's where this model comes in. This is the whole essence behind the no man left behind. It's finding out where the men are in your church along this continuum. The unique cultural Christian, biblical, and the whole idea is to build programming like Greg's talking about in Robert's book and other things to help men move from left to right to where they come out as a disciple. This is something that goes real well once you're ready for your ministry in church. But if none of your men leading this have any idea of who they are themselves, this is probably never going to be as effective. That's the reason I didn't put this in that very first column. To me, this is more of an institutional training, but at the same time, you need to be figuring out who you are. Uh, crafting a vision is another way you've got a mission, vision, values, goals. Uh, and here's a goal setting piece. That's what, what I have given you is this today, that if you got anything out of it, even though some of you have been part of a church for more years than I'll be before I ever leave the earth. You're still continuing to grow into who God's called you to be. I know you haven't given up yet. Some of us are still relatively new as I know there's a lot of growth yet to come. If we get so busy doing church, which is making disciples, that we forget about becoming a disciple, we're not firing on all cylinders or whatever cliche we want to use, we're not bringing our best to the fight because we're not, we don't know exactly who God's creating us. And I promise you, there's one thing I'm convinced of. I was created on purpose for a purpose. I have to believe that because if not as bad as I am, I just say, well, surely <clears throat> God, you made a mistake the day you made me. And that's a, you know, that's a, what do they call it in golf where you get it? Mulligan. <laughs> Take me back and make somebody else. He said, no, nah, if you'll do what I tell you to be, you'll be okay. It's just when you try to do your own stuff that, you, that it doesn't work. <laughs> I truly believe that all of us, men, women, etc., we do have that distinct purpose. And if we're not spending time and sharing those questions with others, who do you think I am? You know, we're doing ministry together. What do you think? Having those conversations, then we're still doing some awesome churches. Mm -hmm. There's some people being fed that weren't fed. They have housing they didn't have. They have clothes they didn't have. All of that's awesome stuff. But we'll never be the full, you know, Ephesians talked about at the end. The reason we go to Jesus to be built up, to become mature, to build up the body of Christ. The body of Christ will never be what it, Jesus is calling it to be until we become mature because we are the body. It's not an awesome complex here. Two side, I've never been to very few churches on both sides of the street. This is a huge complex. But guess what? If nobody comes and nobody shows up, it's just a building with two sides of the street. Mm -hmm. A catwalk connecting them. Mm -hmm. So if you get anything out of it, spend time in prayer. Pray and then be quiet. Listen, because God does answer. Mm -hmm. I just got to slow up enough to hear him. I think I miss his answer. I get in there, so I pray in a hurry because I got to get going. 
And then as I'm getting going, he said, well, if you listen, I, I gave you. So <laughs> yes. spend time in prayer. The, the habits that lead like Jesus says you sustain yourself are prayer, solitude, uh, scripture, reading and applying scripture, and being in sustaining transformational relationship with other people. That's what he did with 12 disciples. For three years, they spent life together. And you know they couldn't have all liked each other. Some of them <laughs> could have all gotten along perfect. Right. There had to have been some pains in the backside. But they worked at it, they stayed together, they became who God called them. So my whole thing to you today is there are resources to help. There's nothing selfish. About being about yourself, you got a choice. It's either selfish or selfless. But either way, it's about you. So take the time to let it be about you. Questions, comments? Uh, are, you sp are you spending time on yourself? Are you taking? Yeah, that's a great presentation. You put five gallons in a pine jar. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but really, and being really from the, well done. And being from the South, you I don't talk fast. <laughs> I'm trying to talk fast, but I probably don't do it near as well as some of the, my Floridian New Jersey transplants that are down there now. They really know how to talk fast. But, but it's all about self. Don't get, don't go beyond, don't go to ministry, don't go to the church yet. And spend some time, because I'm telling you, man, God has some art. I had dinner with my daughter before I left Thursday. And I said, sweetie, if you can just do what your heart telling you to do a problem. God's in there somewhere. Just follow your heart. Amen. And if y'all can do the same thing, I promise you, the ministry, you may always be a leader. And, and, and God may be, that may be exactly what God's calling you to do. But take the time for yourself. Because it's, uh, and if there's a way, I, I, I do this for my ministry. And I'd love to come back to this part of tech. Like I said, I've been to Houston. Eh, not so much. I'd like to try other parts of things. <laughs> no, no, Houston was good. Got, got some good friends in Houston. No, uh, so hopefully maybe some way. If you're ever interested in, in, in some of this electronically, I don't know if y'all have ever done Zoom meetings. It's like a it's like a webinar. Yeah. yeah. All, I present it on PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. You've got your book. You're doing your assessments. If y'all are interested enough in those, I'll probably start another set. What is this? Uh, probably in May. And it's like three weeks. All it takes is three one and a half hour sessions in three three consecutive weeks, and you can go through this book, get a better feel for your gifts, your personal style, and your and your uh, passion. So all of these, take a card if you think you have any interest whatsoever. I'm, I I don't sell any of this. You you don't buy any of it from me. It all comes from somewhere else. I just help kind of implement it. So. Where do you work out of? I mean, where's your home? Oviedo 